Well, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's good to be here. Uh, hope you all had fun yesterday. Uh, we got to see some fireworks uh, just, just that some people were doing across the lake at a friend's house we were at, and it's it's good good celebration. So I hope you all enjoyed it too. Um, I don't doesn't look like we have. Um, any new prayer requests on the list? Um, if anyone has any, go ahead and let me know that we might have missed. Let's uh, let's open up the service this morning in in prayer before we uh, turn to sing. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we're thankful for the country we live in. We're thankful for the freedom that we have. Uh, we thank you for the times when we're able to get together and, and celebrate that. Lord, we thank you um, for everything you've given us, all the blessings you've given us, uh, everything that we have uh, <clears throat> here in this country and, and uh, all the freedoms that, that we have, uh, we thank you uh, for. Lord, we pray for um, our brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for those in the Philippines. We pray for those in... Africa, those in China, Lord, there's a lot of believers around the world that are persecuted and, and don't have the freedoms that we do have. And so, Lord, we pray for them and we ask that you give them um, everything they need. Uh, we know that you'll supply what they need, and, uh, but we think of them and, and ask that you would um, give, give them the help they need and, and all the things they go through. And uh, we lift them up to you in prayer this morning and ask that. Uh, you would help them as, as they suffer uh, for your name's sake, Lord. Uh, and we thank you that we're fortunate uh, enough in our country where we don't suffer, not, not in the same way. Um, but Lord, we, we pray and, and we're thankful this morning for all we have. Lord, we ask for those on our uh, prayer list that we've been praying for, um, that you would continue to help them, uh, Topanga and her grandma, uh, Cassie's. Uncle Jeff, uh, continue to pray for Karen and her back, uh, and pray for Sherry, Jerry, and pray to pray for uh, Ron's mom, Alice, and uh, Georgia Dubois, and uh, John, and Linda Lake. Lord, we lift them all uh, up to you and just ask that you would uh, give them the help that they each of them need in each of their situations. Lord, we know that um, you're able to do all that we ask for and more, and, and so, Lord, we ask in faith that you'd help them. And, Lord, um, we pray and ask for your will to be done. You know, we don't always know what that is, but uh, we still come to you with our requests and, and thanksgiving and, and make many prayer requests to you, Lord, as, as your word says. And so we come this morning and we do that, and we lift all these requests up to you, Lord. We lift up our thanksgiving. We lift up our praise. And, uh, Lord... We ask that you would uh, bless this time together as we fellowship with one another and uh, worship you and sing to you and as we learn from your word, Lord. Uh, we give this service to you and ask that you would use it to uh, shape us and, and mold us and conform us more and more uh, to the image of your Son, that we may become less and that you may become more. And we pray and ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Let's open with uh, hymn 692, the battle hymn. Verses 1, 2, and 4.
Let's sing uh, Unclouded Day, the handout. Just want to, for announcements, keep looking forward to um, what we want to do up at camp. I know we uh, still got work to do up there. We've got one more roof to finish. We finished one off on the work day, and again, we've got a lot of cleaning done. Um, we've got uh, still got to um, get everything taken care of uh, for our yearly lease. So we did get word back from. Um, the feds that um, will still have to do all of that work. So we'll want to just keep diligent on that and get as much done as we can and, and uh, work towards that goal. And if we can get there. We've, we've done it every year so far. So um, I think f that's all it for announcements. I didn't have any others unless someone wants to shout one out that I forgot. Sounds that um, Alice, Ron's mom, has been ill this last week, so just remember to keep her in your prayers. Uh, things sounds like they're getting a little worse. So um, let's uh, continue on and, and sing him 287. All the verses. Three and four. Verses three and four. One, three, and four. Verses one, three, and four. Thank you.
Hymn number 611, Precious Lord. We uh, sing about trembling from the uh, thought of that. Uh, it's really incredible uh, resurrection and uh, the life that we now have, we have in Christ. And, um, but it's not always easy, and so we need to ask God to help us to lead us on. So let's sing that hymn 611, Precious Lord. Well, good morning again. Uh, let's, let's pray once more before we start. Lord, we ask and pray that you would uh, teach us through your word today. Lord, help me as I speak. Help uh, each of us as we listen. Uh, Lord, and I pray and ask that um, it would be your spirit who would be teaching and, and ministering through me, and it wouldn't be um, my words people were hearing, but that it would be uh, your words in their heart, uh, Lord. Um, think of when Paul wrote to the Corinthians uh, that your spirit was teaches uh, spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. And so, Lord, I pray and ask for uh, your spirit to teach us. We, we ask that you would guide us and instruct us by your word. Uh, Lord, we pray and ask that uh, any who don't know you, Lord, would uh, be affected um, by your word, that uh, your word doesn't return to your void. And so, Lord, through sharing the gospel, that uh, those who may not know you could hear it and, and come to know you as we do. Lord, we pray and ask this, and ask that as we turn to your word, that you would uh, give us the help we need to understand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd, I'd like to... Um, Move into Timothy. We'll do First Timothy. I think we're going to start that next week. Uh, today, I'd like to um, preach on freedom. Uh, I thought it'd be fitting for today, uh, this Independence Day that we just celebrated as a country. We celebrated ourselves as a free nation, a nation free from the rule of the British, as it was at our inception. That's what they were celebrating when the nation started, a nation no longer ruled by a king and his will, but rather a nation set to certain ideals, good ideals, ideals which are inherently Christian, ideals like all men are created equal. Uh, we were all of us made in the image of God. We read that in Genesis. There's an ideal that we are given by our creator, certain inalienable rights. This idea that God grants rights, and these should not be taken away from people. These rights incl include the right to live, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness. So they said, 
at the beginning of our country, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility. These were, they wanted peace for everyone and, and justice for everyone. They wanted to provide for the common to de defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ourselves and our children, we do ordain and establish these constitutions of the United States of America. We wanted freedom, we wanted independence. So they started the constitution that they wrote with a declaration. And they wanted to declare, they said, we declare we're independent. And so they started that declaration like this. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So they were justifying why they were separating, but they looked to the laws of nature and of nature's God. And they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that it's apparent to everybody that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They wanted freedom, and they wanted independence. And on that thought, I wanted to turn from that springboard of the ideals of an American uh, independence and freedom to think about freedom uh, biblically and scripturally. And I quoted you from the preamble of the Constitution and, and the Declaration of Independence, but now I, I want to quote to you from Scripture because I think they wanted freedom and independence, and I think ultimately we want that too. I think every human is looking for freedom. They feel the weight of bondage, and that's everyone before they came to God, before they came to Christ, they felt the weight of bondage. They felt the weight of sin. And we all want freedom from that. And so as Christians, I think we should take care to measure out just what freedom is biblically and ask, not in terms of a country, what freedom is, and, and ask not whether in the course of human history if nations have the right to govern themselves. And instead want to focus as we read these scriptures on just what freedom is, true freedom is, and then what is the opposite of that. So turn with me, if you would, to John 8. Chapter uh, John chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 30. Uh, John chapter 8, uh, before verse 30, uh, he's, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's telling them about being the light of the world and, and bearing record of himself and that he came from the Father and that he came... Uh, to bear witness to the Father, and he's asking them why they don't believe in him, uh, since if they knew his Father, who they claim to know, then, then they would believe in him. And uh, maybe I'll pick up in, in verse 24 just to get a little bit more of that context. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And they said unto him, Who are you? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And then they understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. And then Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, and the Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things which please him. And pick it up where I wanted to today, here in verse 30. And as he spoke those words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we, we be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any men. How do you say that you shall be made free? So they're thinking he's talking about a certain kind of bondage. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. The word servant there is doulos. You could say slave. As whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. He's telling them, he's talking to them about bondage and freedom, and he says whoever commits sin is, is a slave of sin. They're in bondage to sin. And the servant, he continues, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I seek that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man which has told you the truth, which I have heard from God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, We have not been born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if, you were, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God's hears God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God's. And then they answered, then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that you are a Samaritan and have a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I, have honor, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said unto him, Now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. If I should say I know him, I shall be a liar Excuse me. If I say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, You're not even fifty years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. He took up stones to cast, him, to cast at him, but he hid himself and went out among the temple and passed by. It's quite a discussion they're having with one another, <laughs> back and forth. Who are you? I'm here to tell you what God has to say. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, yes, yes, I am. No, because you aren't talking about Abraham. He said, well, if you, you, you think uh, you've got everything in Abraham, you don't even do what Abraham says to do. And by the way, Abraham was thrilled to see the coming of my day. We... we went through Galatians where it said that he was preached, uh, the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand and that him all nations would be blessed and Jesus is bringing fulfillment of the message of him being Messiah to them and he, he came to his own as it were and they rejected him. But he tells them, if the Son shall therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Freedom and bondage. A free man or a bond man. Free or servant. 
2 Peter 2, 17 to 19 talks about false teachers. So the whole letter is kind of a warning on false teachers. And verse 17 he says, of these false teachers, they are wells without water. And they have a promise. You know, you, you go to a well, you think you're going to get water. And there's no water in the well. They're clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure the lusts through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, through much uh, behavior without care, those that were clean escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So he's saying they were promising them freedom. He, there's freedom, there's grace, there's liberty. You can do whatever you want. And they themselves were servants of corruption, slaves to their own sins, as it were. He says, because whatever overcomes a person to that is he enslaved. And so it's from here that I want to start to look at the idea of, of biblical freedom. It's not freedom to do anything. It's not freedom to act however you would like, and it's okay because you're saved. Now that's true if you accept the gospel that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, that he died to pay for your sins, and he was buried for your sins, and he rose again the third day in victory. Victory over the bondage of death. Victory over bondage. Slaves to sin, set free from sin. If you believe that Jesus died to save you from your sins, from death, so that whoever believes on him will be saved. If you believe the good news that we can be saved by Jesus, then behold, you're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Behold, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. 1 Peter 1.23 Peter acknowledges that those with faith in Christ, those who obey, preceding verse chapter uh, 1 verse 22, those who believe the gospel are in fact born again. 1 Peter 1 23, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Romans 6 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We're raised to a new life. We died in fact to our old selves. And so, if you truly believe, then you are made new. You're a new creation, a new life, a new birth, born again, a new creature. This process is one that you cannot undo. This is one that God did. It would be pretty arrogant to think that you could undo what God did. He made you new. He gave you new life. He gave you freedom, freedom from sin and death. And so any sin that you commit, you can't undo what he's already done. And you, when you are set free, you're given freedom. But it's not freedom to do anything. It's not freedom to act however you would like, and it's okay because you're saved. Now that's true. That is true. If you accept the gospel and you sin afterwards, it's okay, but only in the sense that you are still saved. You can't undo the work of God. You're no less his child if you falter. The truth of Romans 5, 1 to 5 is not negated by your future sin. The truth of Romans 5, 1 to 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You have the Holy Spirit. You're sealed, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit. And yes, you can sin after salvation and you're still saved. That's true. But that's not what freedom is for. I have the right. I have the freedom. Well, who, who gave you that kind of arrogance? If you were to 
have that kind of an attitude towards freedom, who would give you that kind of arrogance? It's true that the scripture says the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. This is the end of Romans 5, but where sin increased, grace increased, excuse me, end of Romans 4, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law was brought in so the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You say, well, if you sin more, grace will increase more. That's kind of the idea that they had in Second Peter, these teachers who were saying, well, you, you have freedom, but they themselves were captive to their own sins. So it says that if we sin more, grace will increase more, and just as sin reigned in death, so also grace was going to reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But doesn't Scripture say immediately after that, what then shall we say? It does, Romans 5.1. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. God, God forbid. We are those that have died to sin, and so how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. I hope that you're starting to see the biblical idea of freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom in relation to what? Freedom in bondage. Free from what? Bondage of sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again, and death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. Hebrews talks about that, past, present, future. So if you get saved today or you got saved 20 years ago, every sin after that point was still paid for. He died once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, in that same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. True freedom, freedom in Christ is yours. In Christ, and you're under grace. And you were called to this. You were called to this freedom. Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5.1, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. One of the more popular verses is maybe 1 Corinthians 6.12. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Romans 8.1-2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we it, I think sometimes there's a tendency with focusing I think it matters where we put our focus maybe say it that way it matters where we put our focus and when we focus on 
grace, when we focus on the gospel, when we focus on the freedom that we have in Christ, we need to remember freedom from what? Freedom from the law, freedom from sin and death. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so we're told in 2 Peter 2.16 to live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. 2 Peter 2.15 For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish, foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants, as the servants of God. Freedom has an opposite. And that opposite is slavery. And so when we're called, called by God to do a lot of things, we're called to be holy, we're called to be servants of God, and to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. A call in Galatians 5 that said, uh, you were called to freedom, Galatians 5.1, Galatians 5.13, and so don't use your freedom as an opportunity uh, to serve the flesh. He says, instead, walk by the Spirit. So we're called to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. And all those, all those sort of commands, they're not there to negate your freedom. But they might be there to constrain your freedom. Because wanton acts of freedom with no regard for the law constrains you to reap that which you have sown. So don't, don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. You, you'll, you'll reap what you sow. And if you sow from the flesh, you're going to reap bad results. And if you sow from the Spirit, you're going to reap good results. And so... We want to be careful because Second Peter 2.19, whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And you don't want to return once again to a yoke of slavery. You were already set free. Christ is our firm foundation, and in him we have liberty and freedom. He whose the Son sets free is free indeed. And it isn't that you can be saved and go back to slavery, and now you're not saved, and then you need to be saved again. It's not that. It's not that at all. You changed. Your whole destination changed. You're a new creature. You died. It's like you plopped dead on the ground and died, and we buried you. And we took your corpse, and we threw it six feet down. You died. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe he died to save you from your sins, and you share with him in his death and burial and resurrection, then you died. It was like we buried you. That person's not alive anymore. That person's been set free from death, and they've been raised to a new life. They're a new creature. Their old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So Christ is our firm foundation, and in him we have liberty and freedom. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but under grace. And that's, that's good news. That's truly good, good news. And that's the foundation we always keep coming back to, and that we're always building on. We build on the foundation of Christ. He is the cornerstone that the builders rejected. And the good news about him is where we, found our founda where we find our foundation. It's our salvation. He is our rock. He is the rock of our salvation. He is our foundation. He's the cornerstone. There's a tension that I'm sure you feel that we live in. We're free. We know that. Paul, Paul recognized that tension when he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. There's a tension we live in, and we have to realize we have the freedom, but the things that we don't want to do and we do, we've got to realize that we, and think on the spirit. We don't want to be bound to the flesh. We don't want to be constrained to that which we 
uh, we don't want to go back to a yoke of slavery. We built we build on the foundation of Christ. That's why we always come back to the gospel. So Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was rose again the third day. John three sixteen. Any who believe in him won't perish, but have everlasting life. That's our foundation. That's where we always start from. And I think that it's helpful when we think about freedom to not think about varying degrees, but think about the opposite, slavery or freedom. Which one are you going to choose? And if you choose freedom in your daily walks, are you going to choose the sort of unfettered freedom that doesn't constrain itself, realizing that it's been set free from sin? It's a few lyrics from America the Beautiful that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we were listening to a bunch of patriotic songs yesterday, and I came across these lyrics, and I thought, you know what, that's really good. I think it's clear that the writer of the lyrics of this uh, song, America the Beautiful, really understood liberty. I think, they, I think possibly even liberty in Christ. They, the lyrics go like this. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. You're familiar with that word. Some of the other words you might not be uh, familiar with. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. And sometimes people look backwards at our country and say, we uh, did a lot wrong. And I think people back then recognized that too. They said, God mend our every flaw. Confirm thy soul, speaking to their selves, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. They understood they had to constrain themselves. O beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country love and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. They're, they're asking for grace to be shed upon them and, and for their, their brotherhood uh, to be crowned with good from she sea to shining sea. America, America, God shed his grace on thee till past be wrought through wilds of thought by pilgrim's foot and knee. O beautiful for glory tale of liberating strife. Recognition that liberation comes through strife when once and twice for man's avail, men lavished precious life. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Tell selfish gain no longer strain the banner of the free. O beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Tell nobler men keep once again the wider jubilee. You know, there's a person I think who understood freedom. That freedom involves self-control and nobleness and flaws being mended and liberty constrained by law. Strife, which is liberating. I think there's a time when a person looked and saw once and twice men avail to lavish precious life. They're talking about people dying for a cause. Till selfish gain no longer strain the banner of the free. I think they understood that what a man constrains himself to, he's the slave of it. Selfish gain no longer strain the banner of the free. There's the stark differences between selfishness and freedom. Precious life lavished. They're talking about country. Life being precious and almost appearing to be wasted because it's so precious. When we kind of get away from 
our, our citizenship is in heaven. I don't mean to say if somehow um, <laughs> America is somehow a theocracy or something like that or, or try and... I just think that lady who wrote that song understood freedom. And she understood that life, precious life, can be lavished. It, makes, it just reminds me of Christ. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ, God in flesh, for the ungodly. He says, who would do that? Some would dare to die for a righteous man, but who would die for an unrighteous man? Well, I guess, you know, God would. And God commended his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How beautiful to see beyond the years to the unclouded day with an alabaster city, a white city, free from defect, undimmed by human tears. We read that in Revelations. No more tear, no more crying. It'll all pass away. Peace forevermore. If we truly understand Christ, we understand true freedom. And we understand that which we were freed from, sin and death. Free at last, free at last. Those the Son sets free, Jesus says, are free indeed. True freedom means we are determined declare, to declare that we have no part in the old slavery. That old slavery of sin and death, the like of which we want no one to live under, but that we want all to come to the glorious riches of God and Christ. We all want to be set free. We want all to be set free from the bondage of sin and death. And that's why we share the gospel. That any who believe on Christ who came to die for our sins, that any who believe on him will be saved. And they'll share in his death and they'll share in his resurrection in newness of life in an unclouded day with no more tear, no more sorrow, but peace forevermore. So may we go and share the message of the freedom that we have in Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you'd give us courage and boldness uh, to share the message of the freedom that we have in you. Lord, help us to not take it for granted. Help us to not sit and, and take a message, take a book, and, and, and sit on it. If we were to just take this, take a Bible and put it underneath ourselves and sit on it, it would seem a silly thing to do. Help us to not sit on the message and help us not hide our, our lamp under a bowl. Help us to put it on the lampstand for all to see. Give us boldness and courage. Help us to share the message of freedom that we have in Christ. Lord, help us. Give us the excitement and joy in it so that we can say free at last and free at last and, and want to shout it. From the mountaintops, go, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. Lord, give us joy in you. Give us joy in Christ. Give us uh, courage and boldness. Help us to share uh, the message of freedom from sin with the world who needs to hear it. Lord, I pray if there's any who hear this message and, and don't know you, that they would turn and place their faith in you, that they would uh, believe on Christ and, and so receive eternal life. Lord, we pray and, and ask that um, you would teach us uh, more and more every day. Uh, those of us who are no longer slaves to sin and death, those of us who are no longer uh, servants of sin but are now servants of you, Lord, we pray and ask that you would help us to uh, serve you daily. Lord, as, as uh, we live our lives, we want to do that which you have for us to do and, and you've prepared it beforehand and so we can go forward with joy and, and peace and, and comfort knowing that, that you've done that for us. We thank you for that. We, we ask today that you would um, equip us, give us the boldness, give us the courage, uh, give us the joy um, to be able to happily share what we have uh, and um, 
it's, it's good news. Help us to um, continually come back to that and be uh, continually surprised and, and um, in awe and wonder of what you have done for us so that uh, we can share it with that newness and freshness that uh, we should get, that we should and as, uh, as we reflect upon it, Lord. And so we pray and we ask that you would um, help us with these things. Lord, we uh, thank you for everything that you've blessed us with. And uh, Lord, we pray and ask that you would um, give us a good rest of the day. We, we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close with a uh, reprisal. We'll do the um, uncloudy day. Let's uh, let's use the sheet music if you've got that handout, and we'll do um, maybe just the first uh, first verse. Yeah. That's what we do. We go tell people of that uncloudy day and that uh, through Jesus they can come with us. So let's all go and do that. <laughs> God bless. Mm -hmm.